the gospel, and when I was thinking power, usually in preparing for a message, I change my message about six times because the Word of God, when you start studying in the Word of God, you can't, I have a problem, I get one subject and I start going in and then I see something else and then I chase it and then I see something else and I chase it and then so there's been times where Sunday morning I woke up at three o'clock and I still didn't even have a message nailed down. That didn't happen this time. Yesterday I was able to stay on the the theme all week long, I knew what I was going to speak about. Yesterday, I was able to get it finalized, and this morning when I got up at 3 o'clock, I knew I had everything finalized. I just wanted to get it like the, like the cow chews her cud, regurgitates the food, the word. I want to get it inside of me. I don't want to, I don't want to image a false image, you know, an image that, that is disgusting or anything like that, but I, I want that word, I want to chew that word. I want that word to be developed in my inner man to where it becomes one with me, to where I know that. And I think I'm probably going to get ministered out of this message today more than you folks will. Um, the power of our gospel. You know, when I was thinking about the power of our gospel, when we, many of us got saved and when it started out, how did, how did it start out? I know we all know that we were in need of a Savior. We needed help. We needed assistance. And someone came to us and shared the gospel with us. And that was our starting point. And at that, at, at that starting point, you know, when Jesus was with the 12 disciples, he said, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Well, Jesus didn't come to us, at least that I know of, not that I know of any of us, because, you know, Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. That was Jesus in the flesh on earth, dealing with the nation of Israel, dealing with the 12 disciples for the 12 tribes of Israel, when they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging those 12 tribes of Israel. But Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, how, did, how are we getting saved today? How are we, you know, Paul says, in, and we can go to 1 Corinthians 4.16, where Paul says, follow me. And some people may say, well, I'm not going to follow Paul. I'm going to follow Jesus. Well, we need to recognize that Jesus made Apostle Paul, called Apostle Paul, made an apostle. So in 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now some people say, well, that's kind of arrogant of Paul to be saying that, but Paul was saying it because he knew he was an apostle. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus Christ, Jesus of the flesh was of the earth, but Apostle Paul received his calling his message from the risen Christ Jesus when he was on the road to Damascus and he was blinded, knocked down, and he was given a message of the dispensation of the grace of God. And now Paul is saying, hey, be followers of me. Follow me. In 1 Corinthians 11.4, just over a few verses, 11.1, excuse me, Paul says it again. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And then the last one is in Philippians 3.17. I think Joe touched on that one uh, on the first hour. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So when we're looking at our gospel of of power, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. You know, we was all chosen. We were all called. A lot of, a lot of, um, there is a teaching out there where this chosen and being called is a predestination that you didn't have any say in it. That um, there's an elect Calvinism has a tendency to to do that, and I know there's a number of other teachings that if you're saved, you were chosen. You didn't have any say in it. If you're not saved, then you're you were never meant to be saved. That, 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 that's not Bible. I know when we was over at the other facility on the Wednesday night Bible study and, and Rick started teaching, there was a, a young couple that came in and uh, sat down and Rick started teaching and it wasn't even five minutes they got up and as he's walking, exiting the building, he says, that's not Bible. Susie remembers that too. Ruth and Susie were there. It's so sad that they didn't stick around to really understand the message because it is the message, the correct message. It is the correct gospel, and I'm going to discuss on this gospel that there is another gospel out there 
that um, why so many people are confused today. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 4, 2.13, it says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. See, God chose us from the beginning, beginning had an avenue for salvation for us. In verse 14, it says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it started, God had a, had a plan in place for us to be chosen unto salvation. The next verse, it says, where he called us, how did he call us? By a gospel. When the gospel was presented to us, that's how he called us. We responded to that. We believed it, and now we're saved. In Romans 1.16, Paul talks about this particular gospel, that this gospel has power unto salvation. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. There's a power of that gospel unto salvation. To take us from being spiritually dead, and Joe went into the detail this morning about being the, what is it, the five forms of death. You know, you have the physical, and you have the spiritual, you have the, the final death, the functional death. But when Adam sinned, you know, God told him, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're surely going to die. Well, he didn't die then. So what happened? He died spiritually. You know, so we're all spiritually dead because from there, um, Noah came into being, and then Noah had family members, sons, and they were after the image and likeness of who? Noah. Adam was creating the image of likeness of God, but once they sinned, it took on, and that's how we're born. We're born in the image and likeness of Noah, you know, fallen Adam. That's why we need to get back in Christ to get restored to that state of righteousness. But... There's a power of God unto salvation. So this gospel that was given to Apostle Paul, there's power with it. That when people hear that gospel, that gospel is able to go forth, penetrate the inner man, and when that person responds to it, they're saved. In Ephesians 1.13, it kind of lays out a little bit about what, what transpires upon salvation, how it takes place. In Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. When that gospel was presented to you, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Now you're responding to that message, that gospel. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And in Romans 16.25, Paul really nails down what is the gospel for today. In Romans 16.25, Romans 16, Romans 1, 16, 25. There it is, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that has a power to establish you according to my gospel. Notice Paul says, my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So that, you know, there was a secret since the world, it was kept secret since the world began. So we know there's a specific gospel. We also know that you know, some people are saying, if you go to Acts 3.21, we see that there's, it mentions something totally different than what 16.25 ends with. In Acts 3.21, whom the heaven must receive until times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Talking about Israel. Spoke, spoke, that's how God spoke to the nation of Israel, through the prophets. And that was, that was taking place since the world began. Acts 16.25 says it was kept secret since the world began. We can look at those two verses and, and see that there is a, a difference. I was watching YouTube yesterday, and there was a, there was a young gentleman on there, um, and he was, you know, wasn't rightly dividing, as Joe was talking about, right division. Um, and he was just all over the place. And it's sad. And I was listening to him, and I'm thinking, 
you know, if had I not known right division, I would have been, when, I, when the message ended, I would have been so confused I wouldn't have known wh- which end was up. And that's what mainline Christi- Christianity is today. There's so much, so much information that's being thrown out there that no one really knows what is what. So you just have a melting pot where everything's thrown in there, the label Christianity is put on it, and it's for all people just to reach in and dip and pick and choose what they want. That's not my gospel, and it's not a good news message. You can look in, in Israel's program, and any, anything that's not producing fruit, if you're not producing fruit, he's going to cut you off. So we can look at our own lives. Well, if, have I produced any fruit lately? Have I brought anybody in, into fellowship? And if I haven't, maybe I'm, maybe I'm in jeopardy of getting cut off. Now where's your peace of mind? Now where's your, you know, where's your rest? There is another gospel that's going forth, and when that other gospel goes forth, it doesn't have the power unto salvation that Paul's, my gospel, has. Why? Because it's a different gospel. So if you mix something in a different gospel, it's not going to have that power. It's going to lack that power. You know, a lot of people say, well, Keith, why is there so much confusion in the Bible today? Why couldn't God just give a nice, simple message packaged to where everybody could understand it, even the ignorant, you know? And that word ignorance used a number of times with Paul. You know, I, I, I felt like sometimes when I've had conversations with people saying, you know what, you're so ignorant, just to let it be spoken. Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. But the problem is we have an enemy that wants to pervert this message, this good news message, in a powerful way. There was good news specifically for the nation of Israel. God put that message there for the nation of Israel. They didn't receive it. They were put in temporary blindness. The fall, diminishing, they're in a temporary blindness. God rules up an apostle Paul for the dispensation of the grace of God. And that's a new gospel, my gospel that Paul refers to, our gospel. For us today, Satan wants to pervert it. Satan wants to pervert this to the extent, just like he tried to pervert this message. Adam and Eve were created in the first chapter, first and second chapter of Genesis. The third chapter of Genesis, Satan is attacking the very word that he gave to Adam and Eve, and Eve is the, is the one that was beguiled. Adam was just as bad. He was standing right beside her, knew what was going on. But God told, eat, told him that you can freely eat. You know, Eve took the word freely out. God told him, said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Eve took the word surely out. Satan took the word surely out. Again, just a word. Just a word. See, Satan's not going to take a big banner of, of, of a Bible. He's not going to take the Word of God. And, and Joe referred to it about the King James Bible. It's, it, it is such a, a joy to have a Bible that you know that it's accurate, that it's true. You know, I used to have the NIV. and the NIV, there's a number of verses that are distorted, perverted, that put the focus on you and take it away from Christ, the finished work of Christ. But it's just one word. It's just one word, of and in. You know? See, the enemy knows exactly how to, how to deceive people. He knows exactly how to attack that word. He can make, you know, you can throw a frog into a, a pot of water. And, and if it's boiling... He's going to jump right out. But if you throw him in that pot of water and you just slowly turn the heat up, it'll kill him. And that's exactly what Satan does. Beguiled, deceived. And he's constantly attacking this word. Why? Because he doesn't want that gospel, the good news, to get out. He wants to pervert it, keep people in confusion, to where God's plan, the gospel, the good news, is not clearly 
given a clear message to people today. You know, it's sad. So many of the young people today have nothing to do with the church at all. And in, when, when it comes to religion, you know, Dave was talking about um, SWE, isn't it? Southwest East. No, S, yeah, S-E. Southwest East. Well, anyway, he had 14 people in la- last Sunday, and uh, he said he just asked everybody to hold the questions at 7 o'clock when he got done and answer the questions. And he said this lady just kept interrupting, and I think it was five or six times interrupting. But when he handed the cards out for the invitation, he said, now, if you're religious, don't come because this isn't for you. And she, she didn't think she was religious. Come to find out she was religious. Because I asked David, do you think she'll be back? Oh, no, she won't be back. You know? But you never know. Maybe some of that word will start working on her. Because there was a gentleman that I worked with for over a year. Handed him books. Had little conversations with him about right division. And, and then one day, he says, you know what, Keith? Perhaps there is something to Apostle Paul. You know? So you never know. But then when he started teaching right division and they rejected him, he would get so frustrated after dealing with a person one or two months. I said, I dealt with you for a year. You know? He goes, you know what? That's right. You know? But th- there is another gospel that's out there. Galatians, and Paul even talks about it. The Lord Jesus Christ give understanding to, to Apostle Paul. In Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Paul discusses this other gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Here Paul's specifically talking about another gospel. Notice what Paul says, let him be accursed. In verse 9, he says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That word accursed means cut off. Now, if you go go to Genesis 17, we're going to see what the definition, what cut off means. In Genesis 17, 10 through 14, He's talking about the nation of Israel. When they received the covenant from God, there was an outward sign of circumcision that was given to the male Israelites. And what that was, that was a a, a visible sign of their covenant with God. And it says in, in Genesis 17, 10 through 14, Start at verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. (coughs) Excuse me. Notice it says cut off. So when you get over to this other gospel, I was talking to Rick last, earlier this month when we had the men's fellowship. <coughs> Excuse me. And I told him I had a concern about, you know, where Paul says, let him be accursed. And that means cut off. That if a person is believing in a gospel that is not the finished work of Christ on the cross, that they're cut off, they're not saved. You know, before I looked at that, and I said, well, and, and, and I brought my mom up. 
my mom was basically the patriarch, religious patriarch of, of my family. You know, get them, get them, get them kids to catechism and Sunday Lutheran church and dead, 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 dead. You know, I remember catechism. It was the most horrible time for my Saturday to be spent for three hours in a classroom. Dead, dead, dead. Religiously dead stuff. But when I talked to my mom about Christ, yeah, he, he died on the cross for my sins. But then baptism comes in. Oh, you got to have baptism. You're not saved if you don't get baptized. You know, like what Rick said, you know, because she's not saved. Because baptism, you know, and there is like 10 or 11 baptisms in the Bible, and everybody thinks, like Joe said, I remember when Richard Jordan said that, water, water, you know, the minute they hear baptism, it's water, water. The baptism in here has nothing to do with water whatsoever. You know, Joe talked about in the Red Sea when they was going down through the Red Sea, escaping from Pharaoh's army this morning. You know, baptism come about when the high priest was being cleansed. That's where baptism come about because it was in pre preparation for the priesthood. The whole nation was going to be a priesthood, a kingdom of priests to go to, unto all the Gentile nations. That's where baptism comes in. So when John the Baptist, when he come on the scene and he's talking about baptism, Israel knew exactly what he was talking about. They know, hey, we got to we got to be washed, we got to be cleansed, because we're going to be the priesthood, the kingdom of the priesthood that's going to go forth unto the Gentile nations. The problem with it was the nation of Israel rejected the Messiah. So that program diminished when they stoned Stephen. That was Stephen. Thank you, Debbie. She's always correcting me. I always say Stephen, and she says it's Stephen. So that was strike three. They reject God the Father. They rejected God the Son. Rejected God the Holy Spirit. That was the third strike when they stoned St Stephen. So now they're diminishing. Well, here is where Apostle Paul comes into, into the beam. But concerning this other gospel, when you mix anything with that gospel, my gospel that was given to Apostle Paul, you've taken the power unto salvation out of that gospel. And so many people struggle with recognizing that it's all about Christ and not about them. They, they feel they have to do something to be saved, to warrant their salvation. And it isn't. But that's the traditions of man, that's religion, and the cohort, Satan. He wants to get that focus. See, he, Satan, you know, in the beginning, God is like the most high. He's the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. That's what Satan wants to be in Isaiah 14, 14. Isaiah talks about, I'm going to be like the most high. He wants the position that God has. And he's going to do everything he can to get followers to follow him right down to the pit of hell. You know that Joe talked about this morning. Colossians 2.8. Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The spoil. You know, the, the winner of a war, victory, that's, that's, that word spoil is a military term. To the victor goes the spoils. And the spoils really is um, another gospel, is what it is. You've been led by another, another gospel to become the spoil. So many, so many people today would rather believe, even when I've talked to my family, and I really struggle with my family, I really, you know, with my brother before he was killed in a, a, a car accident, and Debbie and I had gone back to visit, I'd pull him off to the side and I just really nailed it down. Because see, I knew he went to catechism too. And I knew he wasn't really active in church or anything, but I, I really wanted to know because I knew he was hitting the bottle pretty hard. 
And I really wanted to know that he knew that Christ died on the cross and that there was nothing that he could do apart from that concerning his salvation. Because that's our assurance. That's our comfort. You know, Paul talks about. Excuse me. And, and I don't know, I think it was uh, like nine months later or a year later, he was killed in a car accident. You know, he was behind the wheel, drunk, coming back from the bar. But I was so thankful that I had that conversation with him the year before. Because I knew. I knew where he was at. Because he told me, he says, you know what, Keith? I don't go to church anymore, but I know that Christ died on the cross for my sins and that there's nothing else that I could do to, to deserve that or earn that. And that was such a joy later when I got that call on a Sunday morning from my uh, son, uh, brother-in-law and um, no, his nephew-in-law and told me that uh, my brother was, was killed in a car accident. And I was reflecting back to that, and I was at Ace Hardware about three months ago. And there was a certain gentleman in Ace Hardware that I go, I, I like Ace Hardware now more than the big box stores because there's, they're always there to wait on you, just like that. You can go in there, and you don't have any idea where, what you need, and, it, and they're right there. And there was this one gentleman there, easy to remember his name. His name was Keith. <laughs> the only name that I won't forget on a person is my name. You know, but his name was Keith, and he was just always a pleasure to talk to. And after uh, Debbie and I went on vacation down to Arkansas, we went down to the diamond mine, dug for uh, diamonds for a day. We didn't find any. Well, I don't know if we found any or not. I brought 10 pounds of rock soil back. I just haven't gone through it yet. But, you know, everybody says, oh, you didn't find anything. I said, well, I don't know. I got 10 pounds of rock, dirt, soil I got to go through. So I may have a few diamonds there, but there was... Keith was at Ace Hardware, and I was telling him what I was going to do, and he was just so excited about it. He said, man, when you get back, tell me about it. And when I got, when I got back, I went by Ace, and he, was, he wasn't there. And I went there two or three more times, and he wasn't there. So one day, there was another gentleman that waited on me. and says, hey, I've been here the past couple months, and I haven't seen Keith anywhere. I says, did he move on? And he says, no, he died. I says, really? And um, asked him if he had any family. He says, no, he didn't have any family, and didn't have a funeral or anything. I don't know if he was in the potter's field or whatever, but he was just a really nice guy. Then I found out that he wasn't saved, and the gentleman I was talking to wasn't saved either. And he says, no, he says he, he lived, he had a way of living and that he didn't really care what lied beyond, that he would meet it when he, when he got there. And as this gentleman was telling me that, I was thinking in my mind, I said, man, this is, uh, this is really sad because he was a really nice guy. You know, and uh, now my my uh, plan is is how I can talk to this other gentleman that doesn't know the Lord and and publicly confess to me that you know has nothing to do with religion, has nothing to do with God, could care less what awaits him beyond when he when he gets to that point he'll meet it. You know, and uh, it's kind of sad, but there's a lot of those people out and about. And I was telling Debbie about it, you know, that it really bothered me how this gentleman, how I'd interacted with him a number of times, but never really took the time to really, really interact with him, you know, because that's what I should have been doing, you know, is talking to him, interacting with the gospel of our salvation. In 2 Timothy 2.24, Paul, Paul talks about, what takes place when there's this other gospel that's out there. In 2 Timothy 2, 24, 25, and 26, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle in all men, apt to teach and patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge and the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice what it says Meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. They literally oppose themselves, you know, for what the message, that of the gospel. God did have us, the dispensation of the grace of God, the gospel over here, there was simplicity in it. We have a sim simplicity in our gospel. In 2 Corinthians 11, 
Satan wants to clutter, clutter it up. 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul had a real concern. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if we receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You know, Paul had a concern. You know, in Romans 5, 4, it, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know, knowing that peace of God, knowing that we're justified. In Acts 17, and Joe talked on I want to go to Acts 17. Because the Greeks, the Athenians there in Athens, You know, it, that just to have a sign out there that, you know, I think Joe said there was over 300, 3,000. That's, that's a lot of gods to keep, uh, to make sure you got them all pleased, you know. That's, that's a, lot of, a lot of studying, 3,000 gods to know that you're, and, and to know that you're not doing something to one god where the other god's going to get offended at it. You know, so you really got to, you know, and again, it, it just goes to the, to the enemy's, enemy's confusion. In, in Acts 17, uh, verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that all things ye are too superstitious. And that word superstitious is fear, fear more demons than anyone, than anyone else. You know, they were just so superstitious. They feared more demons than anyone else. For as I passed by, behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. You know, I mentioned that word ignorant. I, you know, if you told someone today that they, would, that they were ignorant, they might want to put some fists, fists on you, you know. Uh, or you may offend them in such a way that they'll never talk to you ever again. There is a pride in man that does not want to admit. When I talk to my mom about, you know, baptism that, that it had nothing to do with our salvation, when her fist hit that kitchen table like that, and the conversation was over. Didn't want to hear about it. Didn't want to discuss it no more. So now I got to revisit it. And I'm trying to find out a way to revisit that. In July, she's going to be 80 years old. Debbie and I are planning on going back for a surprise, and, I, and I'm sure they're not listening, so I think I'm okay here. <laughs> but I want to get my mom off to the side in a back room or something away from everybody else and just sit down with the Word and just talk to her about my gospel. You know, we've, I've talked to him, you know, I've talked to my dad um, a number of years ago just to check his salvation out, you know, just to see where he was at. And I said, well, Dad, I said, do you know that what Christ accomplished on the cross, that he totally did everything for our salvation, that you're totally justified, totally forgiven, totally accepted, totally loved, you know? And his next statement was, well, why do we go to church? And I know the reason he said that, because he thought going to church was getting those brownie points, you know? And then I explained it to him, to be edified, fellowship with the saints, get to see one another, you know? But... Long story short, I got through my dad, and he, and he recognizes that, you know. But my mom, that's another chore. The effectual, effectual power working. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Rick touched on this one last week. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. That's one of my favorite verses. For this cause also thank ye God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God designed us. God created us. It's God's, my gospel. He knew exactly what it would take 
that when he presented this gospel, when it was presented to us, how it was going to effectually work it in the inner man. And then it effectually works with his power. Paul says, you know, this gospel of salvation, it's unto salvation with power. In Philippians 2.13, Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to, to do of his good pleasure. That's an encouraging verse. In Philippians 1, 4 and 6. Paul says, always in Philippians 1, 4, verse 4 and 6. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with you for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And performing there is that sanctification, your daily, daily interactivity of your daily walk. That brings on the other topic, the power in your daily walk. When work, daily life encounters, um, experiences. You know, Debbie's dad just recently had... Um, had a stroke, and it's a, I guess they call it a cerebral sto stroke, which I never heard anything, knew anything about it, but it, it's where a blood clot goes to the brain, and um, he's doing real good. I mean, he's 89 years old. I, w I hope I'm doing that good when I'm 70, as good as he is, because he's getting around. He gets around. He's a little lighty on the fleet feet, you know. He doesn't have the best wheels to get around on, but he's still coherent, sleeps a lot. Um, but here he is, 89 years old. Debbie gets him in the hospital, um, and these doctors, one doctor wants to do surgery. Drill a hole in his, in his hip. No, that ain't going to happen. Another doctor is bound to determined to get him hooked on some type of medication. Another doctor's got him on Lipitor medication, which has nothing to do with why he's even there. And so she was battling all these doctors that just kept wanting to give him something, you know, and I think it was all about the money. Long story short, that was a... That was a week for my wife of dealing with that before she finally got him back to where uh, he currently lives. But I visited him last Saturday, and I told him, I says, hey, I says, for a small fee, I'll bust you out of here. <laughs> and then when my wife would go visit him, I'd tell her, I says, hey, tell your dad, I says, I'll bust him out for a small fee. He kind of got a kick out of it. But, you know, here, 89 years old, and, and, and here she has to deal with medical forms and and. Doctor, and it, I'll tell you what, it really, it overwhelms me what she has to do for her dad. I'm thankful that her dad has somebody like her. I feel sorry for the people that are in that position where they don't have anybody, that they're all by themselves, because it is a very overwhelming process, especially when you're ill, to know that these people are making decisions that uh, you don't agree with. You know, um, it was sad. Yesterday, Debbie's other sister from California came in because I, I told Debbie, he's doing good, but I said, I think it's a good time to have your sisters come out and see your dad, you know, because he may not be here very long. I mean, he's 89 years old, and he's got a couple clots in his brain right now. And um, so I picked her up at the airport, and I've never gone to the airport without my wife. So my wife says, do you know how to get to the terminal on arrival? She goes, well, you just don't go up. And I says, yeah, well, if I don't go up, then I'm going to stay right on the straightaway. So my first encounter, I'm off. I park over here off of Priest and wait for the call from her sister to, to uh, get her at the airport so I can get there real quick, you know. So off I go. I get the call. So off I go. I get down there, and, um, you know, they've got Terminal 4. That's where I'm picking her up at, right? It says Terminal 4, arrival, oversized on the sign. Well, I'm not oversized, so that doesn't, that's not me, you know. So I'm headed for Terminal 3. So I get to Terminal 3, but as I'm going to, through Terminal 3, I see Terminal 4 across the next street. So I just pull over, you know, I guess where you're not supposed to pull over. And I no sooner and got pulled over and got the window down, and I get her sister's name yelled out when 
someone's behind me honking the horn. And they're livid about honking this horn. So I thought it was a taxi. So I pull out and I pull back in past the cones. And here this vehicle is behind me with this horn. And now there's an arm outside the window waving, you know. And I holler at my sister-in-law. And she, when I hollered at her, she's looking almost directly at her. And when I holler at her, she looks like this. And I'm thinking, what is going on? So finally, she sees me, but I can't stay there. So around I go. So I got to go around. So I call her, and it goes right to voicemail. So it, what it does, it throws you all the way out to priest, where you have to, you know, and then come back again. So the second time, I'm coming back. And as I'm coming this time, I'm reading these signs, Terminal 4, oversized. And I'm thinking, I'm not oversized. But as I get up to it, I realize that's where I should have gone. So where am I at again? Terminal 3, you know? And away I go again. So now I, get on, I finally reach my sister-in-law. I says, hey, can you go to the north side of Terminal 4? Because I'll meet you over there. So I got to go this whole loop, you know? So I get the whole loop. And I get over to Terminal 4, and I finally get her in the car. But I was frustrated, to say the least, you know, because this guy, why they won't let you just park there just for a second, I have no idea. But he was just like a bumblebee on my backside. And he was right now. He was right now. The minute I pulled over and got stopped, he was there with the horn. And it just seemed odd after I pulled out and went back in and pulled in again and I hear this horn, I'm thinking, man, this taxi driver, these taxi drivers, it wasn't the taxi, it was security, you know. But he was like, and then he followed me all the way around to you, you know. I say all that because now I know where to go, you know. But anyway, uh, I, told my, I told my sister-in-law, I said, before I picked her up, I said, I take nothing less than a $10 tip for taxi service. But I had to apologize to her that the taxi service was not up to par, you know. Pardon? No, I never took the tip. I never accepted the tip. Matter of fact, I took her out to breakfast. So, But anyway, I say all that because life can throw some curveballs in no matter what you're in life. Paul had a number of issues. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we all have temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation. Notice it says no temptation. Taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. No temptation that is common to man, no matter what has gone through your brainwaves. It's not uncommon to man. It's kind of a comforting scripture. Sometimes some stuff comes through my mind, and I'm thinking, man, what is going on? You know? When I was at the airport yesterday, and this guy is behind me, blast. I mean, there's one thing honking the horn, but just laying on it, just, you know, because I, I do get on the horn when people are in front of me, and they, they, they need to get right. They need to realize that they're on the road, that they need to drive, that they're driving. You know, I get on the horn, and my lovely wife gets on me and says, don't lay on the horn so hard. And I said, you know what? They shouldn't even be on the road. On what they're doing, they shouldn't even be on the road. But I started getting a little bit disturbed about this guy yesterday. And then I was thinking, you know, I'm right in the middle of preparing a message. That's why this message... It's probably going to minister more to me than to y'all. But it just, it, it allows, it, it's where the rubber meets the road. Sometimes we can forget about that. You know, Joe talked about having a song. You know, you listen to a song, and that song can just kind of be in your mind all day long. It just goes over, and you'll be even humming it. And I, I've done that. My wife says, man, you're still singing that, humming that song? And I said, I can't get it out of my head. You know, that's the way the Word of God needs to be. You know, And I recognized that yesterday when, when I started getting upset and I was going on this big, it was a like four-mile U that I've got to go out, thank God I had a half a tank of gas. I could have done it a couple more times, and I wouldn't have had to go to the gas station. But 
you know, I was starting to get perturbed. I'm thinking, and, and then when I'm coming back down around Terminal 4, oversized, that sign, I kept thinking, what, what would oversized mean? And I, and, I, and I got the radio off, you know, and everything, and I'm trying to concentrate, trying to see this. And I told Debbie, there was one time I almost did a U-turn where I needed a turn right in the middle of the whole thing, which would have been totally illegal, but there was too many cars behind me, you know. So I didn't do that. So what I do is I went on around. But in the midst of that, the Word of God is there for us to keep us on the, on, on the, the, right, on the right path. You know, Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, and 9, and when I was reading this yesterday, I was thinking, you know, what he went through, and I've read it before, and I'm sure you folks have read it a number of times, but I typed it out, and five times, 40 stripes save one. Now, the, the Jews were so religious that they didn't want to abuse the law, so they only whipped you 39 times. In case they miscounted, they didn't want to whip you 41 times because then they would have broke the law and there would have been punishment for that. So that it was 40 stripes save one. Five times Paul went through that. Three times he was beaten with rods. One time he was stoned. Three times he suffered shipwreck. A day and a night in the deep, and I believe that's out in the ocean, a day and a night in the deep is what I interpret that perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of his own countrymen, and perils of the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness besides those things that are without. And then lastly, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So he even had all the, the care of all the churches, the concern of, the, of the, the wolves coming in there in sheep's clothing, you know, being the, the, the other brothers being beguiled or deceived. He had all that. But up there where it says in watchings often, if you go to Acts 30, I mean Acts 20, I didn't know what that meant the other day. And so when I went to Acts 20 and 31, It's where Paul was dealing with the believers. In Acts 20, 30, verse 31, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. That's not it. 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So for three years, Paul, every day, didn't cease from warning someone with tears. Then what's so interesting, if you go to 2 Corinthians 12, in the midst of all that he went through there, twelve nine, where he talks about he has a thorn in his side. And he prayed to the Lord three times that the thorn would be removed. And I'm thinking... You know, here he's got a thorn in his side, and he prayed to the Lord three times. But in the midst of all that he just went through, he's got a thorn. And he said unto me, in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And in verse 7, he talks about the, the, the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My grace is sufficient for me. No matter what we're going to go through, His grace is sufficient for us. And if we look back at a Paul, we see what Paul endured. I don't know what that thorn was. Some people say it was eyesight. I don't, I'm not so sure it was his eyesight. But I just find it interesting that in the midst of that, that he had a thorn that he prayed to the Lord three times he got whipped with a cat of nine tails five times, stoned, you know, beaten with rods three times. I don't know. It really, really kind of deepened my um, thought on, on, on a couple of those verses. Lastly, I'm not going to be able to get through all my verses. I'm running late already. Um, 
the conversation. I want to go to Philippians 3.20. Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. That conversation is our citizenship. What Rick's been talking the past few weeks is about the great white throne judgment and that great right, white throne judgment, how we're going to be there. We're not going to, not the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, help me. The great white, I definitely don't want to go to the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ and how we're all going to get there is how we started out, you know, by my gospel, the simplicity in that, my gospel, not being beguiled, how his word effectually works in us, and his grace is sufficient to see us through our citizenship in heaven. And that citizenship in heaven, after when we go to the judgment seat of Christ and we have our little bonfire or a little wood fire, whatever it is, with the wood, hay, and stubble, then we're going to be presented to the Father, and then we're going to be placed in that heavenly government. And you know, when, last week when Rick was saying, we're going to go um, faster than the speed of light, and we won't need headlights. Well, that one went right over my head, you know? And I was saying, what's he talking about, you know? And it wasn't until yesterday that I finally got that. I don't know. I just, I had like a mental, mental block. I just wasn't thinking. I was thinking, why wouldn't the headlights work? Well, now I know. But anyway, I listened to the message yesterday that Rick preached last week, and I, and I caught that, and then when I reheard it, it kind of dawned on, I said, oh, now I get it, but anyway, we have a sure hope, folks. I thank you for coming out. Um, John Verstegen, keep him lifted up in prayer because uh, I've never had kidney stones. Bruce has had kidney stones. I've seen him suffer through them um, from a distance. I've known friends big friends that have been laid down in the bed from kidney stones. I know that they're nothing nice, nothing comfort, but um, I thank you for your time today, and I, and I pray that this message that I share with you today, the Word of God, that it'll minister and edify you. And let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Father, for your Word that effectually works in all of us, that you've begun a good work in us, and you'll continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. We pray for our families and our loved ones, for those that don't know you, Lord, that you would provide an avenue to where we can discuss their salvation so that when that day comes where they depart, that we know that we can have some consolation. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray.